All right, uh, welcome to part two of this week's lecture. So now it is time to get to the substance. Um, we're going to start with administrative law because it forms the foundations of government agency actions. So what is administrative law? The basic definition is that administrative law is the law that governs how government agencies function. And upon reading that definition, a lot of people think, doesn't matter to me, I'm not impacted by administrative law. But those people are wrong. We are all surrounded by administrative law. The government, or actually governments, plural, because we've got federal, state, and local governments, use administrative law to regulate everything uh, from banking, where your bank accounts are FDIC insured, to transportation, where the Federal Highway Administration has an awful lot to say, to medicine, where your doctor needs a license to practice, to education, where schools have to comply with federal and state laws and regulations, um, to the very food that you eat. There was a study by Colorado State University. It identified over 41,000 41, state and federal regulations that apply to a common sandwich. These regulations apply to everything from grazing of beef cattle uh, to the assembly of a burger at your local fast food outlet. So administrative law, you might not actually see it, but it's all around you. It touches your daily life. Here are some other examples of administrative law in action. Uh, the money in your pocket, that's issued by the Federal Reserve. The water you drink, is protected by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency. The national and state parks you visit are regulated by federal and state governments. Uh, the marijuana that you can purchase legally in Colorado is controlled by the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment. The police are an administrative agency within the executive branch. Um, and of course, air travel is regulated by the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, and the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA. And so, by the way, if you decide to risk a um, sort of sneak mission to the laboratory when you're on a plane, don't ask the flight attendant for permission. The FAA distinguishes between a flight attendant's duty to inform and a duty to enforce. So in general, FAA regs emphasize the information that flight attendants must provide to passengers about federal regulations and when they must provide it. That's why we all have to sit through the same spiel about how you buckle your seatbelt every time we get on a plane. The FAA is a lot less prescriptive in describing how diligent flight attendants have to be about enforcing regulations. Uh, so for instance, FAA regs don't require flight attendants to lock the bathroom doors anytime the seatbelt site is on. Um, and so because of these sort of different expectations, flight attendants have evolved this sort of don't ask, don't tell policy where it would be negligent for them to give you permission to use the bathroom if the seat belt site, the seat belt site sign is on, but most flight attendants aren't likely to stop you uh, from actually getting up when the seat belt sign is on unless they think the conditions are really unsafe. So all of this government regulation is not new. Administrative law has been around for a really long time. Um, so, for instance, Egypt under the pharaohs had a really firm central bureaucracy, and it operated to prevent famine, to provide security, uh, to provide a justice system to settle disputes. They handled public works and also protected the general welfare. The Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire had a really strong bureaucratic regime uh, with a chief administrator, economic policymaker, chief of law enforcement, and a variety of treasury agents. Uh, so Rome originated the civil service merit system and the concept of a paid civil service and other major features of modern public administration that we still use today. Persia, India, China, they all had very strong centralized administrations uh, way, way back. There have even been exhibits in the Smithsonian that feature Chinese administrative art uh, basically art that was created to mark important administrative conferences. Um, so 3,000 year old conference swag, um, you know, the Chinese created that. So thanks, China. 
So administrative law is the body of law that is made by or about agencies. And usually these are executive branch agencies, um, also called administrative agencies. And this body of law governs the way in which agencies can function by defining the powers, responsibilities, limitations, and procedures of agencies. So at the federal level, most agencies sit within the executive branch, uh, controlled by our country's chief executive, the president of the United States. There are also independent agencies. They still technically sit in the executive branch, but the president has substantially less control over them. There are also a small handful of agencies within the legislative and um, judicial branches, including the Congressional Budget Office, uh, which sits in the legislative branch, and the U.S. Sentencing Commission, which sits in the judicial branch. Additionally, we've got state and local agencies, um, including law enforcement, first responders, and emergency planners. So we've got a bunch of different names for agencies. Uh, we can call them departments, commissions, offices, bureaus, councils, divisions. These are all different names for agencies. And executive branch agencies tend to have one of three functions. First, we have our social welfare agencies. These are tasked with promoting the general public health and welfare by providing direct services and benefits to members of the public. So the Centers for Disease Control and the Department of Veterans Affairs are two social welfare agencies. Second, there are regulatory and investigatory agencies that are tasked with promoting or prohibiting certain behaviors, um, including business practices. So these agencies enforce the law through permitting and prosecution. Um, at the federal level, examples are the Federal Communications Commission or FCC, OSHA, the EPA, and the FBI. Uh, third and finally, there are public service agencies. And these are agencies like the National Institutes of Health and the National Science Foundation that provide specialized services usually related to research for the public good. Now, most agencies um, at the federal level are created by Congress. Congress passes a statute known as an implementing statute or an enabling statute. And then Congress places those agencies that are created by statute in the executive branch. So they are accountable, uh, they fall under, and they are accountable to the president. We're gonna focus primarily on agencies whose actions affect environmental rights, emergency management, um, and sort of related corporate actions. So why do we need agencies? Well, generally speaking, we need agencies because we expect a lot from our government. Um, you know, even the most politically conservative opponents of big government do expect police, fire, and other emergency services, uh, protections for consumer bank accounts, food that's safe to eat, and other benefits that government agencies provide. The biggest need for agencies actually comes from Congress. So members of Congress are not and cannot be experts in all subjects, and so they rely on agencies to provide special expertise and technical knowledge. Additionally, agencies are more nimble than Congress. It's easier to implement regulations than pass a statute, um, and what that means is that agencies can adapt more quickly to changing circumstances. Um, in her book, A Fighting Chance, which I recommend to anybody who's interested in the process of setting up a brand new agency, uh, Senator Elizabeth Warren talks about the ability of agencies to move fast. Um, and that's especially important to protect the public health and welfare. So for instance, the Consumer Product Safety Commission can issue recalls if a crib or a car seat is dangerous. The CDC can move quickly to study emerging diseases, um, and to you know, quarantine off areas if necessary. It would take Congress a long time to pass laws to protect the public from each and every new threat, but agencies are able to regulate fairly quickly. Uh, technically, they can regulate in as quickly as 30 days legally, uh, but of course, practically, it takes longer than that. Now, just because we need agencies does not always mean that they are better suited for decision-making. 
So keep in mind that we elect our members of Congress, but we don't elect agency officials or personnel. Also keep in mind that agencies are always involved in the same policy areas. You know, they've got ongoing relationships uh, with the same non-governmental organizations. They're constantly exposed to the same issues, the same problems, and the same external organizations. This isn't really good or bad. It's kind of a little bit of both. Um, and it really depends on the agency, the topic, the public interest, and the related political willpower to get things done. So I want to talk a little bit about sources of administrative law, um, and these are sources of law in general, um, but they're going to be important throughout this class. And those are constitutions, statutes, regulations that are also called rules, court decisions, and executive orders. So pretty much any type of agency action is going to be based on one or more of these sources of law. So the U.S. Constitution, it establishes the legislative branch, Congress, in Article I, the executive branch, headed by the president, in Article II, and the judicial branch, the courts, in Article III. And the Constitution grants specific authority to each of the three co-equal branches of the federal government, and it creates what we call a separation of powers between the branches, um, also known as checks and balances. So you've got the legislative branch that creates the law, the executive branch that enforces the law, and the judicial branch that reviews and interprets the law. Now the Constitution says absolutely nothing about agencies, but we do know that all aspects of the government are supposed to be governed by the law. And so agencies have to possess authority based on one of these sources of law in order to lawfully conduct their business. For our purposes, there are two sources of authority that are really important at the outset, and these are statutes and regulations. And both are grants of authority to an executive branch agency, but they are developed in distinctly different ways. So it may surprise you to learn that agencies have lawmaking authority because we tend to think of laws as statutes passed by Congress or by a state legislature, and that is true. Congress passes a law saying that we're not allowed to pass counterfeit currency, and so we don't print our own $20 bills, or if we do, we get caught and we get prosecuted. But Congress can also use statutes to delegate some of its lawmaking authority to agencies. Um, so, for example, Congress tells the FAA to regulate air travel, so the FAA promulgates regulations, and those regulations have the force of law. And that's why, as uh, we noted earlier, you have to follow orders given to you by a flight attendant. On the screen is an example of a statute. Um, it's got nothing to do with our class, but it's fairly simple. And it is from Title 15 of the U.S. Code, and the U.S. Code is a compilation of federal statutes passed by Congress um, and signed into law by the president. So in this one, Congress is authorizing the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, to create rules that prohibit deceptive or abusive telemarketing acts or practices. So in this case, prescribe rules means promulgate regulations. So that is create and issue regulations. And this is a direct grant of authority from Congress to the FTC. So the FTC and other agencies carry out their authority in two ways, adjudications and rulemaking. Um, adjudications are sort of like mini court trials, and we're gonna talk about them later in the semester. Rulemaking is like a mini legislative session, and it produces regulations which do look a lot like statutes. So on the screen, is an example of an FTC regulation that defines and prohibits certain abusive telemarketing practices. So at first glance, this doesn't look a whole lot different from the previous screen, but you can see that this is from Title 16 of the CFR, that is the Code of Federal Regulations. Um, it is not from the U.S. Code. So the U.S. Code is for statutes passed by Congress. The CFR is a compilation of regulations issued by federal agencies. So by issuing this regulation, the FTC used the authority granted to it by Congress to carry out the will of Congress, or at least the will of Congress as the FTC understood it. 
So think of it this way. Statutes create a broad legal framework, uh, you know, the will of Congress, and then agencies fill in the details of this broad legal statutory framework with specific regulations. And both statutes and regulations have the force of law. Executive orders also grant or restrict agency authority. Um, so on the screen is just one example of an executive order. So this is one of the ways, executive orders, uh, that the president can order the executive branch, you know, the various administrative agencies that report up to the president to enforce the law. This particular EO was issued by uh, FDR back in June of 1941, and it requires fair employment practices in defense industries. Um, so it requires both the Defense Department and its contractors, private organizations, to adhere to principles of non-discrimination on the basis of race, religion, color, and national origin. Now, keep in mind, there are limits to executive orders. Um, a president cannot overturn a statute via an executive order. That would violate uh, separation of powers because Congress is responsible for passing the laws. The president can't even overturn a regulation via executive order, um, even though regulations are issued by the executive branch. And that is because of the Administrative Procedure Act, a statute passed by Congress. The APA requires public notice and comments when agencies issue and repeal regulations. And we're going to talk about the APA uh, later in the semester. It's actually pretty short and sweet, but very, very important for the functioning of our, our executive branch. All right, now we're going to get into environmental law, which is the study of the ways in which humans interact with the Earth its resources, and even with each other. Environmental law encompasses all different sources of law. You've got statutes passed by Congress, uh, regulations issued by agencies such as the EPA, case law, uh, that's the opinions written by judges, that forms the basis of our nation's common law, uh, which is judge-decided law. Um, this is something uh, that we get from ye old England. Um, environmental law has executive orders. Uh, so, for instance, in March of 2017, President Trump ordered the EPA to start reviewing the Clean Power Plan. Um, even constitutions matter to environmental law. Environmental law taps into rights granted to us by the federal and state constitutions. Okay, so what is environmental law? It's the law that governs how we use and protect our environment. That's a very basic definition of an incredibly important field of law. Um, our quality of life really depends on being good stewards of the environment. And this should not be a controversial statement, nor should it be a partisan one. Uh, back in 1984, Ronald Reagan, um, in his State of the Union address, he said that, and I'm quoting here, the preservation of our environment is not a liberal or a conservative challenge. It is common sense. And so protecting our environment should not be controversial, but sometimes it is. Um, and sometimes this is because people of good conscience have different opinions and priorities. Uh, sometimes it's because of human greed. Um, and a lot of times it is because of a lack of understanding. Um, so throughout this course, I really urge you to put yourselves in the shoes of others. You know, pretend that you are a resident of New Orleans, 50% um, of which is below sea level. Pretend that you're a fourth generation cattle rancher in Montana and your family's also grazed on the same lands. Pretend you're a Native American with ties to the land that go back thousands of years. Pretend you're a miner in West Virginia and your livelihood depends on the success of the coal industry. Um, or pretend you're a manager in an oil company and the jobs of 50 of your neighbors depend on your business decisions. Pretend you're the parent of a 10-year-old living in Flint, Michigan, unsure of whether your child's been poisoned by lead in the water. And I ask you to do this because if you could put yourself into other people's shoes, you're gonna have a better understanding of why environmental law poses such thorny questions and hopefully a better understanding of the way to obtain results that are mutually beneficial for 
all aspects of our society. So much like with administrative law, we tend to think of environmental law, you know, we in the US, we tend to think of it as a recent development, but it's not. Um, environmental regulation began way back in Roman times um, because of the need to protect the water supply. The public health aspects of environmental law continued throughout Western Europe, um, even during what we tend to call the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages. So there were catastrophic events like the Great Famine and the Black Death. Also the fact that people were at the time living through what we now call the Little Ice Age. These events made people think about the environment in more nuanced ways, you know, rather than simply fearing it. Throughout a lot of human history, we have been afraid of our environment um, and often for good reason. You know, fires, earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, harsh uh, storms, droughts, and other environmental disasters are scary things. But over time, humans became aware that they had an impact on the environment. Um, so this is why in the 1300s, England prohibited burning coal within London city limits and it also required Londoners to properly dispose of waste. Later during the Renaissance, Queen Elizabeth I of England recognized that everybody has a right to use air and water. You know, these are things that belong to the people. Uh, switching over to the American colonial period, uh, people like William Penn, Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson gave a lot of thought to both taming and protecting the environment for future human use. So for example, Pennsylvania passed laws requiring the preservation of forests and other wild lands. Uh, ben Franklin uh, fought against the practice of just dumping waste into rivers, you know, with no thought of how it impacted communities downstream. All throughout the Industrial Revolution, which really started in uh, Britain, the British enacted laws to reduce the negative impacts of coal and chemicals. And possibly in response to that Industrial Revolution, in the 1800s, American transcendentalists, led by people like Walden and Thoreau, found a spiritual aspect of nature. Uh, there was still a desire to sort of tame and exploit the American wilderness and its resources during our westward expansion, but this also became tempered with a desire to preserve areas for the public benefit. So throughout the 1800s in the U.S., national parks and national forests came into existence. You know, Americans at that point identified with this frontier attitude because of uh, westward expansion, but the frontier by this time had pretty much disappeared. And so Americans started thinking seriously about preservation and land management. In 1905, under Teddy Roosevelt, the USDA created the US Forest Service uh, to manage public lands for the greatest good and the greatest number of people. After World War II, as more Americans traveled the country and got to experience our national parks um, and our various uh, sort of environmental landmarks, our preservation movement gathered steam. A defining moment of environmental law came in 1962 when biologist Rachel Carson published Silent Spring. And that was an examination of environmental damage caused by pesticides. In response to that book, um, and really like the public outcry that that book created, the US federal government began to regulate pesticides for the protection of human health and the environment. So prior to that, states and local jurisdictions handled most environmental regulation. And that not only created a patchwork of laws that varied from region to region and even from town to town, but those laws were just not sufficient to deal with pollution that was spreading from other jurisdictions. So throughout the 1960s and 1970s, Congress enacted a variety of environmental laws that we now take for granted, uh, like the Endangered Species Act and the Clean Water Act. These laws impacted public lands, but also lands that were owned privately. Now, while most Americans agree that clean air, clean water, things like that are important, the way that our federal agencies have implemented these laws has often been controversial because of their impact on property rights um, and later the rise of the NIMBY movement. So that's the not in my backyard. Um, gridlock in DC 
and a general breakdown of bipartisanship, um, you know, over the past decade or so. Uh, it's really forced federal environmental laws and regulations into a holding pattern. And currently, um, particularly under the Trump administration, most regulatory actions have been aimed uh, to deregulate rather than create new regulations. And in part, that is because regulations, along with everything else, have become really politicized over the past few decades. Now, certainly there are policy arguments that play out via regulations, and that is appropriate. And we need to have competing policy arguments um, because these topics are just really complicated. But the existence of regulations themselves should really not be a partisan issue. The government exists to protect the health and welfare of the public, and reasonable, thoughtful regulations should do just that. They should protect the public health and welfare while also allowing for innovation and a free market. So as we attempt to apply environmental laws to address our current environmental problems, um, we need to understand some of our common underlying causes of those problems in order to legislate and regulate effectively. So we have to tackle issues of scientific uncertainty, market failure, uh, mismatched scales, our own cognitive biases, um, and or some non-traditional interests. And I caution you, don't ignore the or. There is often and perhaps always more than one underlying cause of any given problem. Scientific uncertainty um, and along with our current and unfortunate distrust of a lot of science, this is a major theme in environmental law and regulation. Science continually evolves as scientists gather and analyze more data and rework past assumptions in light of new data. But science takes time and money, and there's always some level of uncertainty because environmental problems are complex. And honestly, uncertainty is really baked into science. That's why we've got the scientific process. Uncertainty is especially problematic uh, for new products and technologies because we don't have the benefit of studies over time. As I mentioned, you know, Congress can't do in everything relatively few elected representatives or scientists, and that means that Congress and state legislatures, they lack a lot of technical expertise necessary to even understand complicated issues, let alone know how best to resolve them. And again, this is in part of why, we, why we've got agencies to provide this expertise. But even if Congress were comprised entirely of scientists, you know, that doesn't mean that they would all be in agreement. Even when scientists agree about the existence of a problem and maybe even the cause of a problem, there are good faith disagreements on the best way to correct the problem. Additionally, Congress is supposed to serve its constituents, all of them, and we all tend to have competing views on environmental issues and everything else. And as you'll read um, in the book, A Civil Action, Scientific uncertainty poses special challenges when it comes to holding polluters liable for the harm caused by their pollution. It's really difficult to establish scientific baselines in humans. Uh, just because something causes cancer in mice doesn't necessarily mean it does the same in humans. And obviously it is unethical to experiment on human beings in order to establish a baseline. Um, as an aside, that's another area where administrative law comes in. There is, for example, a federal common rule for the protection of human subjects. Um, all federally funded scientists, and well, really hopefully all scientists in the US at least, abide by that common rule to make sure that they are protecting humans who are involved in their studies. So as we'll see in a civil action, and also in a lot of class action lawsuits that stem from pollution, some of which we'll cover in this class, there is this uncertainty. You know, did somebody get cancer because they live in a highly polluted area? Or are they just genetically predisposed to getting cancer? Um, or maybe they smoked cigarettes or they applied pesticides in their home garden. There are a lot of different potential causes of cancer and other medical conditions. So companies that are targeted with lawsuits, um, such as the Woburn case that we'll read about in a civil action, 
or the class action suit against PG&E that was featured in the movie Aaron Brockovich, companies often use scientific uncertainty to their advantage. And scientific uncertainty also makes it challenging for policymakers to tackle complex environmental problems, especially when these problems stem from multiple intertwined causes. And we're not able to predict the future, but oftentimes our policymakers, they need to make decisions about environmental conditions today. So our textbook talks about the precautionary principle, and that counsels caution in the face of uncertainty. You know, don't take action if action could lead to harm. But too much caution leads to inaction, and that itself can be detrimental both to the environment, uh, so for instance, see our current climate change problem, and inaction is detrimental to the economy because businesses need to understand the regulatory schemes um, with which they need to comply. And so at some point, policymakers need to choose which risks to accept, and they also need to accept the fact that they could be wrong when they make those decisions. Another issue relates to market failures. So protecting the environment benefits society. Um, it benefits both people and it benefits companies. You know, after all, a company can't make money if all of its customers are dead. However, as noted in uh, this week's assigned reading, the market has failed to address a whole host of environmental issues. So one thing that we need to do is align environmental protection with the broad self-interest of both people and companies. And we also need to understand why the market has failed us in certain ways. So the market fails by being inefficient. The costs and benefits of any transaction should be borne by and should accrue to the people involved in that transaction. So if you think about it simply, you go to a car dealership and you buy a car. You give money to the dealership, the dealership gives you a car. The family who lives two streets over from you doesn't receive any benefit of that transaction, nor do they pay any cost associated with that, that transaction. That is an efficient transaction because it balances out entirely between the two parties. You pay for the car, the dealership gets your money, the dealership gets you a car, now you've got a car, so that balances. Unfortunately, that sort of balancing act is very difficult to achieve when it comes to our environment and public health. So the environment is, to a large extent, a public good. Public goods are resources that clearly have value, but they don't necessarily have market value. And if something has no market value, then we really can't expect the market to appropriately regulate it. Um, additionally, there are problematic phenomena that attach to public goods, uh, the free rider problem, the tragedy of the commons, and the challenge of collective action. So most of us know about free riders. You know, these are the people who don't pay for resources, but they gain benefits from it. Um, so any of us who listen to NPR but never get around to donating uh, you know, during the NPR membership drives, we are free riders. We're not paying for public radio, but we benefit from it. Most of us have also heard about the tragedy of the commons, where overuse of a common resource by a few people eventually leads to a depletion of that resource for everyone. We don't hear about challenges of collective action as much, um, but it boils down to the fact that the more parties involved in a transaction, the more difficult it is to come to an agreement. Um, think about the car buying example. If you and the dealership also had to get input on make and model of your car from your neighbor two streets down or even your next door neighbor, then things get bogged down. You know, maybe you want a red Mustang, but your neighbor hates the color red and asks that you get a black one instead. Maybe your other neighbor thinks that sports cars are a waste of money and they burn too much gas and they want you to get a Prius. So suddenly it's more complicated than paying for a car and receiving a car. And that is the problem, one of the challenges of collective action. More people, more difficulty in coming to a single mutually beneficial solution. So free riders, tragedy of the commons, and this challenge of collective action, these are useful in understanding the concept 
of environmental externalities. So externalities, they are unintentional side effects of an activity that impact people other than those people who are directly involved in the activity. Um, in the environmental scheme, they are costs that are borne by the public, not by the private entity responsible for those costs. So for example, a factory has to pay for its operations, but it doesn't have to pay for the use of the air, and it doesn't have to pay usually for harm caused by factory pollution. Pollution becomes an externality, um, and in this case, it's a negative one because it can harm the public. There are also positive externalities. Uh, you can think of these as good side effects. You know, a group that cleans up a local stream creates benefits for people who had nothing to do with the cleanup effort. Uh, that is not necessarily a problem, but it can lead to the free rider issue where we just assume somebody else is gonna take care of it. So one solution here in the environmental arena is to internalize the externalities. And what that means is we need to include them in the cost for the people who are engaged in the activity. You know, make a factory pay for the harm it causes, and it's going to find ways to cause less harm. Um, you know, if you live in an apartment, let, I want to think about this just from a personal perspective. If you live in an apartment where your rent covers electricity and heat, it doesn't matter to you if you pump the heat up to 75 degrees in the winter or you blast the AC constantly in the summer because you're not paying for it. But once you move into a house or to an apartment where you've got to pay for your utilities, um, you tend to conserve electricity because you don't want to get hit with a $400 electric bill at the end of the month. So as a society, we need to align environmental protection with broad self-interest so that doing the right thing for the public and the environment is also doing the right thing for our bottom line. Uh, mismatched scales are also problematic. Um, so a lot of the problems encountered by our society in managing natural resources arise because of a mismatch between the scale of management and the scale of the ecological processes being managed. So these are problems um, that occur when planning for and implementing conservation activities is at a scale that just doesn't reflect the scale of the conservation problem. Not recognizing and accounting for these challenges when planning for conservation can result in actions that really don't address uh, sort of the multi-scale nature of the problems and they don't achieve their objectives. So as an example of mismatched scale, think about recycling. Many of us accept the fact that we should recycle our plastics and our glass, and we do. But individuals are just no match for huge companies. We can recycle absolutely everything, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of plastic being churned out by companies. That's not to say that we shouldn't recycle, because we should, but we need to recognize that individual recycling alone isn't gonna be sufficient to address the scale of the problem. You know, Earth, it's a complicated web of entangled ecosystems, and we as humans still don't fully understand them. You know, there's that scientific uncertainty again. The distribution of our natural resources and our ecosystems, these don't follow our man-made political boundaries. You know, rivers flow through multiple states and countries. Um, each of those has its own distinct need to use water for drinking washing, agriculture, manufacturing, and waste disposal. Pollution doesn't follow political boundaries either. You know, a factory in Commerce City, Colorado, that's spewing smoke and chemicals into the air, that's isolated from a buffalo ranch in Wyoming, but that ranch in Wyoming might be suffering from the pollution created in Commerce City. So the entities that create pollution, they're often both geographically and politically separate from the people and communities who are harmed by it. There's also an issue of management authority. Um, we will discuss this in more depth later, but who should manage the Commerce City pollution? You know, certainly the people living in and around Commerce City and their local governments are closest to the problem. They've got to live with it on a daily basis, but some of them are also benefiting from it. 
So do we leave these issues in the hands of local communities, or is it better to manage these issues at the federal level uh, where there's likely more expertise um, because regulatory agencies can employ scientists and economists? Um, at the federal level, there might be a better understanding of widespread impact. You know, but we have to consider, is it right for the federal government to run roughshod over a state or a city that is most directly impacted by any given issue. Economic boundaries, this is another issue. We have a global marketplace. You know, here in the US, states compete for business. Um, just look at the competition back in 2018 for cities to host Amazon's HQ2, its second headquarters. You know, some people think this creates a race to the bottom and you can think about this outside the environmental context. Uh, think about taxes instead. States give huge tax breaks to corporations. If Maryland knows that Virginia is offering $5 billion um, in tax breaks to Amazon, maybe Maryland's gonna uh, offer 6 billion instead. Then Delaware might offer 7 billion. You know, these tax breaks, they're great for Amazon, maybe not so great for the residents who then don't have tax dollars available to fix failing roads, bridges, and electrical grids. But other people say this is actually a race to the top. You know, maybe Amazon wants to be in a state that highly values education because Amazon wants to hire the best of the best. In that case, states might compete with each other to have the best public schools and the best universities. We also have to deal with mismatched scales of space and time. Nature's processes are long-term, but humans, we tend to think in the short-term. Um, we're probably not even capable of thinking truly long-term because geologically speaking, humans have only been on this planet for a very tiny blip of time. Um, so these are just things that are really incomprehensible to the average human being. Stephen Hawkins might get it, uh, but, you know, Jen Gartner, not necessarily. Then we've got good old cognitive bias, and we generally don't even notice these unless they're called out. Um, there are different types of cognitive biases, all of which create challenges for environmental regulation, among other things. Um, framing, this is one form of cognitive bias. We tend to oppose an issue if it's framed as a loss, but we support it if it's framed as a gain. So if a politician wants to raise taxes, you know, her opponent's going to go on the attack, you know, telling voters, oh, Senator Jane wants to take your money, you're going to lose your money. But what if Senator Jane frames it not as losing money, but gaining safer roads? You know, that frames it as a gain. And then what happens if the election takes place in a jurisdiction where a bridge recently collapsed, you know, killing 200 people on their morning commute? Suddenly, paying $100 more in taxes over the course of a year doesn't seem so bad if it means that you and your family members are going to come home from work safely. So there are a lot of different forms of cognitive bias, and more than one bias can and often does operate at the same time. So for instance, we tend to dig into our positions when challenged. You know, doubling down is an almost unconscious reaction in humans. We also tend to assume that everything is a zero sum game. My win comes at the expense of your loss. You know, if you're not winning, you're losing. On top of all of that, we base our judgments on irrelevant information, and we tend to be super overconfident in our abilities and judgments. You know, our brains naturally look to familiar events and to events that are still fresh in our mind to predict future events, even when the circumstances are not the same. And when it comes to environmental issues, the fact that humans are generally bad with numbers and bad at evaluating trade-offs, this is an especially difficult bias to overcome. And we as a species are just not very good with numbers. This doesn't mean that we're bad at math, it's just that we have time conceiving of extremely large numbers or the concept of time on a geological scale. So it's really hard for us to think in these super long-term ways necessary to tackle problems that have been in the making for hundreds or even thousands of years.
So how do we tackle these multiple complex underlying causes of our environmental problems? We can start by using frameworks. Frameworks allow us to organize and structure our thinking. Um, there are many different frameworks, but we tend to focus on four of them in environmental law. And those are the environmental rights or ethical framework, sustainable development, utilitarianism or cost-benefit analysis, and then fourth, environmental justice. Now, applying a different framework to the same problem may actually lead you to a different policy position. So whenever you're analyzing or debating environmental policies or really any other type of policy, be sure that you know the applicable framework because it is framing your conversation. Make sure that you understand how that framework was selected. You know, our policy disputes are often really difficult to resolve simply because the parties aren't talking about the same thing. They're operating on different assumptions and they're using different frameworks. So we got to get on the same page in order to really resolve um, our differences and implement effective policies. So the concept of environmental rights is one such framework. Uh, the United Nations says that all humans have the fundamental right to an environment of quality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. And some U.S. states have also enshrined, uh, enshrined this right into their state constitutions. So under the environmental rights framework, we operate under the assumption that the U.N. and this handful of U.S. states are correct. Humans have a right to a clean, safe, sustainable environment. And I think most of us agree that we want for ourselves and hopefully for others a clean, safe world in which to live. But holding too strictly to this framework can result in really intractable policy positions. Um, it pushes us to extremes. So environmental rights is a useful framework, but we have to take care not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. It's noble to want a perfect environment for every human and every animal on the planet, but it's not realistic. And policies only work if they take into account the reality of the world in which we live. And as we've discussed it so far, the environmental rights framework focuses on humans, uh, not just those of us currently living, but also on future generations. But humans are just one species of animal. So what about others? You know, do non-humans have environmental rights? Um, fairly recently, scientists and ethicists have recognized that certain, hum uh, certain species are non-human persons. And that list includes dolphins, whales, chimps, great apes, and even certain species of parrots. And these animals exhibit characteristics and tendencies uh, consistent with that of a person's traits like self-awareness, intentionality, creativity, and symbolic communication. Now, some people dismiss this idea of non-human persons outright. They just find it silly to think that uh, animals can have rights. Other people believe the concept of non-human persons doesn't go far enough. They feel that all animals have equal environmental rights and traits of personhood don't matter. This eventually boils down to a personal choice, but I will say that I was really surprised to learn that dolphins, for instance, name their offspring, and a dolphin keeps its name throughout its whole life. And that, to me, is a very person-like trait. Uh, so I can see this argument that dolphins are non-human persons. But moving beyond that, what about nature? Does nature itself have environmental rights? And while we worry about environmental rights, is it fair to ignore other rights? So, for instance, property rights. What if my farm, which has been in my family for generations, is suddenly designated as a protected wetland? Does that mean that I have to stop using my farm and protect the wetland? Or can I continue using my farmland to support my family? Do nations have a right to use their natural resources as they see fit, you know, hopefully for the benefit of their people, even if the use has a negative impact on their neighbors? You know, if you think about it, many developed nations, uh, certainly including the U.S., we've used our own natural resources and also the resources of others to our benefit. 
can we now tell other nations they're not allowed to do the same thing? Do businesses, both the organizations and the employees within them, do they not have a right to make money and make a living? Uh, does the community have a right to make decisions for itself rather than having decisions imposed upon it by outsiders? You know, these are just some of the rights that might conflict with the framework of environmental rights. Sustainable development is um, another framework through which we can review environmental law. This framework focuses on both the environmental protections, but also economic expansion. So it wants to integrate environmental rights with business and property rights in an attempt to meet the need of existing humans as well as future generations. The sustainable development framework recognizes that our planet just simply can't accommodate indefinite unchecked growth. Um, it's just not possible. We have only the one planet. Um, you know, we can't mine it and destroy our, our ecological systems. However, the framework also recognizes that without economic growth, we as a society, uh, both nationally and globally, can't tackle important issues like poverty and disease. And additionally, this framework takes the position that developing nations do have a right to develop. You know, we can't or we shouldn't force India to remain impoverished or force people of rural China to live without electricity just because we in the United States and in Europe were lucky enough to put together our infrastructure uh, first before we realized the damage that we were causing to the environment. So here we have a framework that highlights the importance of limits and incentivizes us to find sustainable ways to develop um, within the constraints imposed by our natural environment. And as it turns out, that's where science can be really, really useful. Um, so starting in the 1940s, really ramping up in the late 1960s um, because of the book, The Population Bomb, there were serious concerns that by now we'd all be dead because we'd have run out of food. Um, the Malthusian theory, which posits that the population will grow exponentially and will outstrip food supply, was really back in the spotlight because of the booming post-World War II population all across the world, but, uh, but in the U.S. But obviously, we have not all starved to death. Agricultural science has come a long way even since you know, the 1960s, even since the 1980s, and has shown itself to be capable of feeding billions of people around the world. So sustainable development, it's about protecting the environment for future generations while also meeting the realistic needs of people who are alive today. Our third framework provides a dose of utilitarianism, cost benefit analysis. Um, as the name implies, this framework balances the costs and benefits of environmental policies. So it's not that simple in practice, but in theory, a policy whose benefit exceeds its cost should be implemented and a policy whose costs exceed its benefits should not. Government regulations tend to be based, at least informally, on some version of a cost-benefit analysis. But this requires placing a monetary value on items that are hard, if not impossible, to quantify, such as the cost of human life. Does it, you know, does it matter if that life is two years old or 102 years old? Does one have more value? What's the cost or the value of avoiding a medical condition in 10 years? Does it depend on the medical condition? Does it depend on whether the medical condition is caused purely by environmental conditions versus genetic influences and lifestyle choices? What's the benefit of a day spent fishing on a lake? You know, does it matter if your benefit is based um, you know, on the ability to pay for an expensive fly fishing trip or what if you're using the fish to put food on your plate? You know, what are those benefits? What's the benefit of a flourishing economy? If a rising tide lifts all boats, then maybe good business is good for all of us. So when regulating, agencies are supposed to take the most cost effective approach, but because of the difficulties of placing monetary value on certain items and because of the ethical concerns about doing so, Congress often prohibits agencies from engaging in explicit cost-benefit analysis. So again, you know, part of this is based on ethical considerations. 
is it acceptable for the law to allow harm to one person or one community if it benefits others? And in part, this restriction is based on practical considerations, you know, namely that it's not always possible to make comparisons. It's not always possible to assign you know, value to something. So there's that problem of scientific uncertainty again. Our fourth and final framework is environmental justice. This framework also looks at costs and benefits, but it's concerned at how they're allocated within a society. You know, if the burdens or harms fall primarily on disadvantaged communities, there is environmental injustice. So this framework recognizes that minority and, and or poor communities often lack political power, and because of that, they have historically borne a disproportionate share of burdens. Um, so environmental justice advocates point to, for instance, the recent uh, water crisis in Flint, Michigan, where the state government failed to adequately protect a city that happens to be predominantly black and where 40% of city residents live below the poverty line. If Flint were a gated community of white collar professionals, would the government have paid more attention? Uh, quite possibly. Now, to be clear, this framework of environmental justice does not imply that these failures are intentional. Um, you know, sometimes they are, but as mentioned earlier, we all have cognitive biases and they operate subconsciously. So instead of, you know, assessing blame, this framework asks policymakers to examine both procedural and substantive justice to ensure that everybody's got access to the process by which environmental policy decisions are made and that the actual distribution of environmental benefits and burdens are fair. And access to the process is key. When we think about justice, we often think about it substantively. Is something right or wrong? We don't think as much about it procedurally. But you can't access the policymaking process without having access to the resources that are required to understand your policy options. That includes access to a decent education, access to scientific experts, and access to the policy decision makers. We know that not everybody enjoys this equal access. We know that there's an unequal distribution of burdens in our country and also globally. So how do we correct it? One way is by incorporating concepts of environmental justice into agency rulemaking, into issuing regulations. Um, our federal government often addresses socioeconomic issues via agency actions, such as requiring that recipients of federal funds maintain adequate anti-discrimination policies, uh, like FDR's executive order about, uh, you know, outlawing discrimination um, for defense contractors. So to correct historic as well as current environmental injustice, agencies are required to identify and address any disproportionate impacts, even the unintentional ones, of a proposed regulation when that regulation might adversely affect human health or the environment. Okay, now we're going to turn incredibly briefly to the law of all hazards management, which focuses on disasters, how we prepare and respond to them, and how we attempt to avoid them. We are gonna talk about this in much, much more depth uh, later in the semester, but I wanted to really briefly touch on it now, um, particularly for those of you who are here for the environmental law and not the all hazards management law. Okay, so what is all hazards management? It is an integrated approach to emergency preparedness. It focuses on developing the capacities and the capabilities required to respond to a whole spectrum of emergencies and disasters, both natural and man-made. So does this mean that government agencies um, and the majority of all hazards management falls on state and local agencies, does this mean they have to plan for everything? No. Instead, you focus on the hazards that are most likely to occur in your particular area. Now, I tend to think of hazards as falling into three broad categories. You've got your natural disasters, your fires, earthquakes, floods, blizzards, hurricanes, etc., cetera, uh, plus the inevitable power failures that result from any of those disasters. Then you've got your unintentional human hazards, 
Um, a bridge collapses from lack of maintenance. There's an outbreak of measles or Legionnaire's disease. Uh, you know, a company in Silicon Valley accidentally creates artificial intelligence that turns against humanity. Um, hazardous chemical manufacturing facility blows up. And then we've got our intentional human hazards, such as terrorism and cyber attacks, uh, which can include infrastructure attacks, building collapses, and result in fires, biosafety emergencies, and other types of emergencies. So rather than planning for any of these events as a one-off, all hazards management focuses on developing the capacity to respond to a range of emergencies. You know, it doesn't matter whether you experience an earthquake, uh, a bridge collapse, uh, a massive transportation accident, a bombing, um, you know, regardless of what happens, your local hospital needs to operate efficiently and effectively to save human lives in any of those situations. It probably needs a backup generator in any of those situations, just in case. Your emergency responders always need access to the scene. They need to be able to establish a perimeter and they need the correct protective gear. You've got to establish a command hierarchy and agency personnel need to know and trust each other. So all hazards management is about preparing to effectively protect the public health and welfare by planning for operational continuity regardless of the emergency. And it always involves a coordinated, cooperative process of matching urgent needs and available resources. So why are we combining all hazards management and environmental law? So they actually operate in tandem in a lot of emergency situations. So emergency managers, like all agency officials and personnel, have to operate within prevailing laws and regulations. In the US, uh, the primary federal law for all hazards management is the Robert T. Stafford Disaster Relief and Emergency Assistance Act, known as the Stafford Act. At all levels of government, the Stafford Act and related state laws assign responsibilities for the main tasks that have to be accomplished in emergency situations. And emergencies can easily trigger environmental laws. So for instance, if a chemical factory explodes, you have an immediate emergency at and around the factory, but there's also a really high chance that chemicals are gonna leach into the groundwater or pollute the air, triggering oversight and remediation by the EPA and other environmental agencies, uh, including those at the state level. Additionally, the physical environment is a key consideration in all hazards management. So emergency planners need to understand how the natural environment is likely to react and how disasters might be aggravated by factors in the human environment, um, such as the placement of water treatment facilities or hospitals, um, or even factors like decision makers uh, have been underfunding emergency planning or underfunding our infrastructure. So ever since I first started preparing this course about a year and a half ago, I've really been constantly surprised by the overlap in environmental law and all hazards management law. And you'll probably notice it yourselves when you and your classmates post news items. There's just a lot of overlap. Okay, congratulations. You have made it to the end of your first lecture of our course. Um, there are no graded items due this week, but I would like you to respond to the survey on discussion group size. Um, this is a fairly large online class. We've got uh, nearly 30 students enrolled. So typically, I run online discussions just as one big group because that's how we would do it in a face-to-face -face class. But typically, I've got closer to 20 students. So I wanna know if you prefer one big group discussion, uh, two still rather large groups, or three smaller groups, um, or if you don't have a preference at all. You can also get started on discussion one, which is gonna be due at the end of next week. And you should make sure that you start reading a civil action in time to be ready to discuss it uh, the week after spring break. So thank you so much. I look forward to getting your feedback on that survey. I'll start checking the discussion boards. Um, and so I will see you on the discussion boards. Have a great week.